So I believe that our transition from gas burning cars that we own and drive ourselves to a world in which we're driven around in electric cars is happening faster than people think. One of the big implications of that will be we'll need to figure out how to generate the revenues to support our public infrastructure in this new world. So in this video, I want to delve into this question. Where will the money for our public infrastructure come from? How will we spend it? And how can we make the best decisions so that we all live in the cities and suburbs and spaces that we want to live in? So according to a study by Oxford Economics, this is the forecast spending on infrastructure from now through 2025. So there is a ton of money that is headed towards roads and railways and ports and airports around the planet from now through 2025. The predominant spending is on roads and the predominant region is Asia Pacific. In fact, between now and 2025, Oxford Economics forecasts that $5 trillion is gonna get invested in, in Asia Pacific on roads, which basically dwarfs total infrastructure spending in the rest of the world. There's a lot of money that countries are planning to invest in building and upgrading their roads. How will we pay for this? In the United States, we use a combination of usage fees and general purpose taxes to pay for our roads. So we use the gas tax on gasoline, we use parking fines, we use vehicle registration fees, we use driver's license fees, we use toll roads to pay for our roads. The proportion of money that comes from usage fees like the gas tax has been dropping over time. Let's think about each of these fees in the context of electric self-driving cars. So the gas tax will go to zero because these cars won't be powered by gasoline. We won't have individual vehicle registration fees because we won't, by and large, own and operate our own cars. Ditto for driver's license fees. So a whole set of funding for our public infrastructure will need to change. We can't pay for it the old way because the old way is predicated on taxes that simply won't exist. A logical place to put a tax would be in the context of your fleet fees. So if there really is a lift anywhere type product, some part of each ride would get um, taxed and that could go to pay for infrastructure. There might be other ideas for how we find infrastructure, but I do know that the old taxes aren't gonna work. So let's assume we figure out how to pay for our roads and other infrastructure. Then the question is, how do we invest it? So we're headed for a very exciting time in urban planning. In fact, I think one of the most interesting jobs of the next few decades will be urban planner and designer. Because if you think about it, our cities really have only had four chapters to date. We're about to write the fifth city of chapters. The first chapter was cities in which we walked around. Then the streetcars came. Then the recreational cars started driving through the cities. And then finally, we put highways to connect the cities. So we get the opportunity now to write the next chapter of cities. We get to rethink how big should the road be? Who should use the roads? How will they get shared? So super exciting design decisions are going to have to be made in our cities over the next decades. So here are some bookends that show you the extremes of how city planners have approached this problem. Let's talk about Copenhagen versus Los Angeles. As of November 2016, there are now more bicycles than cars in Copenhagen city center. This was a city that never really fully embraced the car. They said, look, we want our city to be pedestrian and bike friendly, and as a result, more bikes than cars. Contrast that with Los Angeles, from an LA urban planner's point of view, basically any question that you asked about urban planning could be answered with, let's build more roads, let's build more highways, let's build more parking lots. And we ended up with LA being the way that it is. So how could we reimagine how we use roads in our cities? This is a very typical US city street. It happens to be Peachtree and Third in Atlanta. And you can see in this street, it's a car dominated road. A bunch of people will use the streets, pedestrians, bikers, and buses, but they kind of do so uneasily. The car is king. Now or imagine this four-lane road with just one lane for cars, freeing up room for self-driving buses in its own lane, bikes in another lane, and maybe even a lane for greenery. Now what in the world would we do with all the cars? Lyft's actually been running the numbers on Wilshire Boulevard in LA, and they calculate that when we switch to self-driving fleets, we can actually get more cars through just one lane versus the four lanes that it takes today. How in the world would you do that? Well, 
You can imagine many more single passenger cars like the smart car where there's only room for one passenger because we don't need room for the driver. We could imagine automatically implementing all of the recommendations from Waze so that we get the optimal traffic patterns for the city. We can imagine implementing surge pricing to discourage people from all leaving their offices at 5 p.m. You could imagine right-sized buses that have a much better sense of their actual ridership, and we'd be running buses with just the right capacity. You could imagine the traffic lights coming out of the cities. So there's a lot of creative ways to reuse the space that we've already allocated in every city. You could even imagine reprogramming the roads. So this thing is called the zipper. And for those of you that haven't seen it, it drives up and down the Golden Gate Bridge and it reconfigures how many lanes are northbound versus how many lanes are southbound. And obviously you wanna reconfigure the lanes so you can maximize the throughput of the bridge. You could imagine doing this exact same thing all in software. So if self-driving fleets could get map updates on the fly, one of the attributes of the map would be what direction is it safe to travel in this particular lane. We could dynamically update that without sending a bright yellow truck up and down the roads. Another exciting opportunity for urban planners is reusing parking spaces. In the world of self-driving, we won't need nearly as many parking spaces because cars won't be parked and left idle. The fleet operator will want that car either on its way to pick up a passenger or on its way to getting recharged. It will not want its cars sitting on the street somewhere. Let's look at how much space could actually get reclaimed, and I'm going to show you the growth of parking spaces in L.A. since the 50s. Basically, the browner the region of the map, the more parking lots there are. So here's L.A. in the 50s, in the 70s, and in the 90s. Altogether, L.A. is about 14% parking lots today. 14%. Imagine that I could walk into the city planning office of L.A. with a magic wand, and I say, I can give you back 14% of the entire area of your city to put to a better and higher use than parking. How happy would you be? Now, parking lots aren't the only thing that will come out of cities. Driving schools, AAA shops, auto parts stores, auto service centers, traffic lights, and the gas stations. So we get to reimagine uses for these spaces as well. And if that wasn't exciting enough, urban planning could go 3D. There are a set of startups that are working on not only tunnels beneath the cars, like Elon Musk's boring company, there's also a set of startups and established companies that are working on flying cars. So we get to extend our thinking into the third dimension, both below the street surfaces and above the street surfaces. Super exciting time to be an urban planner. So it's going to be a super exciting time to be an urban planner. Let's put our best and brightest into spots of authority so that they can make the best possible decisions about the shape of the cities and suburbs we live in.